Well, good uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, lecture that's been put together by our uh, university strategic research group in, in, in energy. Uh, we're very proud of our cross-cutting strategic groups that we have in various uh, in various fields, and this is certainly one of the ones that uh, uh, it, it has been very active. So thanks to the, the team for putting putting this together. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Very pleased indeed to have uh, Professor Jim Ski with us. Uh, he's got obviously uh, research interests in energy, climate change, and uh, technological innovation associated with that. He's a professor of sustainable energy at Imperial College, uh, he, where he joined in 2009, and he is currently a Research Council's UK Energy Program Strategy Fellow. Uh, uh, post he started in in, uh, in April 2012. Um, he was research director of the UK Energy Research Centre between 2004 and 2012, and has previously directed the Policy Studies Institute and the Economic and, uh, and, the Economic and Social uh, Research Council's Global Environmental Change Program. Uh, he acted as launch director of the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership. So you can see from his credentials, uh, he is ideally suited to speak to us uh, on the, the topic of his. Uh, uh, lecture this afternoon. Uh, he, throughout his career, he's operated at the interface between research, policy making, and business. And his most recent book, Energy 2050: Making the Transition to a Secure, Low-Carbon Energy System, addresses the link between decarbonisation and energy security policies. So again, that whole business of making energy policy work in practice is very much his uh, his forte. He's a founding member of the UK Committee on Climate Change and a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 3 uh, on Climate Change Mitigation. He's also a non-executive board member of the BlackRock New Energy Investment Trust. So I can think of no one better qualified uh, to give our strategic research group in energy uh, a, a lecture this afternoon. So hugely grateful to Jim for making the time to come and see us. He said it's a while since he came to Southampton and it's great to see him here again. Uh, we've shown him some of the things we're up to in the field of energy this afternoon and I, I hope we've impressed him. Uh, we'll find out later I guess. Jim, uh, over to you and thank yeah. you again for coming along. Okay, I should just say that the job title that Phil read out uh, for the research councils is the one that's written into my contract, and it's so long it doesn't fit onto a business card, which is why I managed to get it reduced to, to the slightly smaller title that I've actually got here on the, on the title slide. So this is essentially a talk that in one form or another, I've, I've done two or three times now since I took up my new post about four or five months ago. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to briefly say what is happening to energy R&D around the world, what, what, what at the high level is happening, what is driving these significant changes, what kind of R&D do we need if we're actually going to hit all our long-term goals, and in the UK are we going about it in the right kind of way. And that then leads perfectly in a chance where I'm going to shamelessly publish, publicise my new role because a big part of it is engaging with the community of energy researchers. So it, it, I, I would hope to see more of people like, like Gail Frank Taylor around the system as, well as we talk about it. So first of all, uh, taking a, a kind of a 40, 40 year, 35, 40 year perspective on what's happened to energy R&D globally, uh, you can see back in the 1970s, early 1980s, we spent a lot of money globally on, uh, on energy R&D, almost $20 billion a year at the peak. As soon as oil prices fell in 1986, uh, the interest in energy R&D fell away really quite considerably. But the very striking feature is roughly since 2000, it's all been ramping up again in terms of the volume of spend. There's a very funny spike there for 2009, which is actually the effect of the US Recovery Act. So, but uh, you, you focus on the, the smaller 2010 number. So clearly, we're entering a period uh, you know, when energy R&D is on the up. It's becoming much more interesting again. The other thing that I would pick out is the very big difference in the portfolio of energy R&D that's being carried out. Because back in the 80s or so, it was very, mu very much dominated by nuclear research, and that includes uh, nuclear fusion within these numbers. 
The mix is very different now with a bigger emphasis on efficiency, on fossil fuels, particularly carbon capture and storage, renewables and other, which includes issues like, like smart grid, for example. So big changes taking place at the, at the moment. And this is the picture, same picture for the UK, when, you know, again, we spent an awful lot of money back in the 70s and 80s. We hit the bottom at £30 million pounds a year in 2002, an incredibly low level of spend. But you can see that the recent efforts from the research councils and others you know, have, have uh, led to substantial increases. We're definitely not back to the 70s and 80s levels, but it is quite a significant ramping up taking, taking place. And as I was talking with people earlier this afternoon, a big chunk of that fall in the 80s was associated with the privatisation of the utilities when major research facilities were, were, were actually closed down. I just say before the, the lecture started, I, I just met somebody I haven't seen for 30 years which when we helped to spend all that money around the, the, the 1970s. So my career in, in, in interest is actually pretty well mapped onto this graph, effectively. There was a period in the 90s where I didn't do very much on energy at, at, at all. So it's your fault. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I'm a leading indicator of, of, of spend, actually. So what's driving it? Well, one driver at the moment is clearly the issue of climate change is, it is a big driver, especially in the UK and Europe. And although we didn't get an agreement uh, you know, at the Copenhagen conference in 2009, there at least has started a process internationally at the Durban Conference of the Parties for the UN Framework Convention at the back end of last year. So there is now an agreement to, to uh, negotiate a new legal instrument, international instrument for climate change, that would cover all countries that are signed up to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that includes developing as well as developed countries. The Kyoto Protocol is moving into a second commitment period from 2013, though minus the Canadians and the Japanese, Europeans, Australia, etc., are still involved with it. And in the interim, all governments that made, made emission reduction pledges at the Copenhagen Conference in 2009 for 2020 have agreed to continue with them. And these are just examples of the, of the kind of numbers that, that, that people put up. I should say, for those people that have said things conditionally, uh, the EU 20% unilaterally, 30% conditionally, and other people moving, we're still stuck at 20%. And because of Fukushima, Japan has no hope whatsoever of, of, of entering into a new agreement or achieving that kind of reduction because its nuclear power is being replaced by gas and coal, effectively. Uh, also, at, uh, at, the, at the, the Copenhagen conference, a number of the key developing countries made emission commitments, which were much more based on relative emissions, you know, reducing CO2 emissions per unit of GDP. And that Chinese number, which is the headline one, for a 40 to 50 percent reduction in uh, unit uh, emissions of CO2, is probably not as radical as it sounds, given you, if you put it on top of the growth that would be expected in, in the Chinese economy. But there is a lot happening on the climate change side internationally. Uh, this is the, basically the very high level framework for the UK. Uh, we now have uh, five year carbon budgets in place that are legally binding on the government. And there are now four consecutive budgets running out to 2027 at the moment. The orange bars are the ones that are currently in legislation. Uh, the purple ones on the right-hand side of budgets two and three are the ones that the Committee on Climate Change vainly recommended to the government to, to actually tighten the budgets as a result of this recession, uh, that the government has decided not to do that. But the fourth budget is quite a controversial one. It, it, it raised a lot of issues within government. Different departments didn't want to accept the Committee on Climate Change's recommendation. But basically, it's for a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the mid-2020s, starting from the 1990 level. There will be a review of that in 2014 uh, as to whether it's still, still appropriate, but it is a very, very ambitious target for the UK. And if we listen to the noise that's coming out of the Liberal Democratic Conference in Brighton and what the Labour Party has been saying, uh, there are at least two parties that would want to stick with, with that kind of level of ambition. Now, the second 
big driver, I think, is the question of energy security. I know that worries energy ministers just as much as, as climate change does. And this is another historical one pulled off from IE International Energy Agency data, again going back to the 70s, which shows uh, inter-regional trade in crude oil over that period. Now, very obviously, with the oil crisis of the 1970s, there was a very strong policy response in the consuming countries, and the, the, the dependence on crude oil trade really fell very dramatically up till the early 1980s. But again, oil prices fell in the mid-1980s, and since then, we've seen that renewed dependence on oil internationally. <coughs> so in fact, North America is now back to the 1970s levels, uh, Asia is more dependent, and it's only really in Western Europe that you've actually seen uh, uh, we're still below the 1970s levels of dependence. Partly, of course, because we have had oil in the, the North Sea to help us. Uh, for every import, there has to be an expert, an export, and there's the we need to be an expert as well, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, this this is the, the same thing for exports of crude oil. And you can see that the Middle East has been the dominant uh, source of that extra supply that's come back again since, since, since the mid-1980s. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit of an increase from Latin America and also uh, Eurasia. So the other thing about oil is it's uh, the major vulnerability to particular choke points in terms of trade for oil. And I won't go through it. This is actually for. 2003, but in fact it hasn't actually changed that much since then. At, at that time, about 20% of the world's oil was moving through the Straits of Hormuz, that very narrow pinch point bet between the Arabian countries and Iran. And IEA projections suggested that would rise to about a third over the next couple of, couple of decades with Middle East dependence. So this question of the vulnerability to geopolitical vulnerability of oil supplies is another one that's been in the back of people's minds. And the final one on oil, this is actually from the BP Statistical Report of the World. And not, I've not only gone back to the 1970s here, I've gone back to the 1860s with this diagram to show that the green one higher up is the price of oil in, in effectively $2,010. When oil was first found in Pennsylvania, it was at very high levels. For most of the time since then, it's been down in the 10 to $20 per barrel range. But we had the huge spike in the 1970s that you can see, and now new spikes in 2009 and 2011 that are taking it even beyond the 1970s levels in real terms. So this question of uh, volatility of oil prices, which we would expect to continue, and the, the sort of the macroeconomic effects of that are something that are also continuing to worry people. So removing dependence to, on crude oil imports is a key factor. And certainly in the United States, the concept of energy independence is an absolutely major driver of energy policy. Climate change isn't mentioned at all, but energy independence is very much a, a key factor. Now just to, to do the th same thing for natural gas as for oil, this is again inter-regional trade in natural gas, which is, was essentially zero back in the 1970s, but has really grown very, very rapidly uh, to a level that's about 20% of, of the level of the trade in crude oil, and it's expected to continue. And you can see that there are two regions of the world that are, are mostly responsible for consuming that internationally traded gas. That's Western Europe, where we're getting liquefied natural gas coming in, plus pipeline from Asia. And OECD Asia, which is essentially <coughs> Japan, which is getting lots of gas coming in by LNG. So the question of vulnerability to gas <coughs> trade is also something that's starting to worry politicians a lot. I used to say this, this is, again, the other one, exports of natural <coughs> gas with... Uh, with uh, Afri African exports from LNG at the bottom in red, and the stuff that's coming from the Asian, the Middle Asian states being very important as well. And I think this question of the changing role of gas in international markets is an absolutely critical one, not least because we have new sources of natural gas that have become available essentially in the United States. 
um, supplies of shale gas have actually completely transformed the North American uh, gas markets. And it's had ripple effects around the world. Uh, for example, because all this gas has become cheap, American power stations are burning less coal, which has then changed the coal markets, which has reduced prices, which means that we've switched from gas to coal for power generation in Europe. And then that gas is very nicely <coughs> moved to Japan, where it's making up for nuclear after the Fukushima accident. So it just shows the kind of ripple effects that you can get through the, uh, the, the global energy economy. So I think, I think you can see that there's lots of big worries now that explains why we are back at this historically high level of interest in energy R&D that can help to reduce dependence on more traditional sources of energy and would also help address the climate change agenda. This isn't really a long-term driver, but I've been writing a paper with Japanese and German colleagues about <coughs> different, the, the way that people have reacted to you know, the Fukushima accident, and there have been big changes. I, I think keep calm and carry on is very much the UK approach. We still formally have aspirations uh, for nuclear new build, but both ja Japan and Germany have now decided to renounce the nuclear option, with Germany wanting to close all its plants by 2022 and Japan by 2039. So very, very, very big changes, and, and I think the Japanese situation is particularly difficult because they are so dependent on imports for their energy sources. But I'll just flag up the, the issue. There is, the, the business case for new nuclear investment in the UK is actually probably a bigger challenge than, it, than is any aspect of public opinion. A number of companies have withdrawn from the nuclear business. The two German companies, obviously, with big investments in the UK, RWE and E.ON, have decided not to go ahead with nuclear in the UK. Scottish and Southern Energy has pulled out, and Siemens, the German equipment supplier, has also pulled out of the nuclear business. And so th there are lots of sort of interesting sort of ripple effects from the Fukushima accident that, that, that could make a difference to energy markets, which means there would be more reliance, for example, on re renewable energy. So what kind of energy R&D are we going to need, apart from the fact there's going to be a lot of it? You know, what is, is the kind of style and the, the focus of the research? Now, this is, uh, this is again to, to tell the sad story of Britain in about 2002 and uh, why our investment in energy R&D got so low. This is public sector R&D spend as a percentage of, of GDP with uh, different countries on it. So you can see that at the time this data applied to, which I think was about 2006, 2007, the UK was spending 0.01% of its GNP, GDP on energy R&D, compared with countries Japan, Finland, almost 10 times that kind of level in unit terms. And many of our major competitors in Europe have been spending a lot more money uh, on, on energy. Uh, this is another one. We were talking earlier about uh, what happened when the CGB uh, closed down its research facilities and sent the equipment to places like Southampton and Manchester. This is actually from, I think the origin of this is uh, the Department of Business's R&D scoreboard, which shows the percentage of value added that different, different sectors of the economy actually spend on R&D. And electricity, gas and water supply is gloriously low at 0.1%. Uh, this is, this is, this is the, the situation we've had. I have to say this slide misses out oil and gas, which are actually a bit higher, more around the 1 to 2 percent level, and the nuclear sector, which does spend a great deal more, maybe in the 3 to 4 percent. But it's to focus you just on how little companies spend. There was one of the big, big six companies, Scottish Power, which cheerfully reported uh, to the survey that it spent absolutely nothing on R&D whatsoever, and you, because it wasn't part of its business. It was to cut costs out of mature industry was what it's, it saw its job as. But this kind of thing is turning around, I think, quite, quite a lot. And companies are now, as well as the public sector, companies are now changing. So the UK support for energy R&D has been low historically in comparison to other countries, and for energy, it's low in comparison to other sectors. As you say, in sectors like pharmaceuticals, the, the volume of value added spent on R&D is really, really huge. Now, this is uh, 
a, a graph that's taken from the International Energy Agency's Energy Technology Perspectives Report, which is now produced every, every two years. And one of the things that they have been doing is to, is to focus much more on technological needs as well as their traditional role of emergency oil and gas sharing. And what they, they do produce every year, they produce something called the World Energy Outlook, <coughs> which is a kind of picture for how they expect demand and supply for energy to develop globally. And they're now looking up to about 2030 in these World Energy Outlooks. But with the Energy Technology Perspectives Report, they've actually taken it out further, out to 2050, and taken a very long-term view to get a sense of the technologies that we might need. Now, one of the things, I, I don't need to go about a lot of detail because it's climate change rather, rather, rather than energy, is that the, the Copenhagen Agreement uh, cited the aspiration to keep global temperature increases below 2 degrees centigrade from pre-industrial levels. And that was reconfirmed at, at, the, at the Durban conference. Now, you can do the modelling and work, work your way through it, but if you are going to give yourself a roughly a 50-50 chance even of getting to that two degree target, global emissions of greenhouse gases would need to halve from current levels by 2050. And that is actually another reason why the UK got its 80% reduction target for greenhouse gas emissions, because that was deemed to be the equitable share of that global target by equalising greenhouse gas emissions per capita as they would be projected out to 2050. So the, the UK's 80% is an equitable share, in, if, if you think that's the way that equity is defined, uh, for getting a 50% reduction globally. So what the International Energy Agency has done through with this work is to work through with uh, reasonably foreseeable technologies that might be deployed by 2050, how you could actually hit that target by deploying different, different types of technology. And we don't want to, you, you can see the difference, the baseline emissions is what happens if we just have the policies we have now, the bottom of it, the bottom of this wedge is the trajectory to actually hit the two degrees target. And to sum it up, um, basically uh, about half of the delivery of the reductions would come from things that happen in the power sector. We have low carbon power generation technologies that have been deployed. There's costs obviously a question, but they could, they could actually be, be deployed in the future. <coughs> and the main options are obviously nuclear power, various forms of renewables with wind, biomass and solar being the, being the dominant forms, and then carbon capture and storage, assuming it can be demonstrated uh, associated with, with the continued use of fossil, fossil fuels. I should say that nuclear wedge looks very low. It's actually bigger than it appears because there's lots of nuclear in the baseline scenario anyway in different countries. That's the extra nuclear that you would put in if you were going to get the emissions down. And the remainder of it is effectively uh, end-use uh, measures, efficiency, but also changing the kind of energy vectors. And one of the uh, one of the <coughs> key big pieces of the narrative, both in the UK and elsewhere, is that if you can decarbonise electricity, and um, the UK's aim is roughly to pretty much decarbonise by 2030, it makes more sense to use electricity in places where it has not been used before because a low carbon economy would effectively become a more electric economy. So the interests in the transport sector in things like plug-in hybrid vehicles, uh, battery electric vehicles is part of that bigger story, as is potentially the use of heat pumps for home heating rather than the traditional gas-fired gas boiler. So the, the, this, it's a three-pronged story, decarbonise electricity, improve the energy efficiency, which is very cost-effective to do in the short term, and the, the, the electrification of demand. So that's starting to tell you a picture about the kind of technologies and where R&D might start to be focused. So the message is that the IEA comes out with, we need a portfolio of low carbon technologies, there's no silver bullets. Fossil fuels will remain important for the future, they have, <coughs> still have a role to play in transport, natural gas for heating will be there for a while. Energy efficiency is the best measure in the short term, the power sector is absolutely critical, the electrification stories and uh, 
we will need new technologies. We need R&D if we're going to sustain emission reductions beyond about uh, 2030. Now, the, uh, again, to make discussions on the, on the value of R&D, when I was still at uh, the UK Energy Research Centre, we did this project, Energy 2050. And one of the themes that we looked at within that project was a the theme of technology acceleration. What would happen if you put in sustained R&D efforts that improved the performance and reduced the cost of various forms of energy technology? We looked at known technologies with credible prospects for deployment, and we looked at performance enhancements and cost reductions that we pulled out from energy R&D roadmaps that had already been published. And these are the technologies that, that, that we looked at, mostly on the supply side, I have to say, rather than the demand side. So a range of renewables, but also moving to fourth generation nuclear development of carbon capture and storage, etc. Now, what we were interested in is if you accelerated the technologies, to what extent would this make delivering energy services to consumers while hitting your carbon targets? What kind of cost savings would you get in the long run from investing in that R&D? And that squiggly black line there, it actually says what at any particular point in time, the, the, the reduced costs of the energy system once you had invested in that extra energy R&D. And if you levelise that over time, over the time horizon out to 2050, the value of these savings would be just below £1 billion per year. Uh, so you can make the argument that you could potentially invest up to £1 billion per year in energy R&D, and it would be worthwhile for the country in the long term if you were going to secure these savings. Now, it's interesting. We're not actually that far out of it. I mean, obviously... You know, way back in 2002, we were down somewhere about here. Once you do an audit of what's actually being spent now, it's probably more up at this kind of level. So there has been a substantial change, and we're not all of the way towards this. I don't think uh, George Osborne and the Treasury would be convinced by the argument that I've just offered to, to you. But we are actually well on the way in, in sort of you know, turning the corner on energy R&D. Now, uh, the last question I want to answer is, are we doing it the right, going about it in the right kind of way? I know that active scientists may well have strong views about the way that the research councils conduct themselves here. I'm going to draw the canvas slightly more widely. Ideally, if you're thinking about how you actually get new technologies to market and deliver them, there's, it's a long, long process that goes right from sort of more basic R&D down at this, at this part of it here, the more technology science push. And over at the other side, you're actually thinking about putting in place policies that will draw and pull, pull technologies onto the market using instruments like the renewables obligation or feed-in tariffs to do it. And in the middle, which is often the difficult stage, you might need much more applied R&D to help pull the technologies forward on from the, the more basic science. And this is a picture from the Department of Energy and Climate Change's first ever science and innovation strategy that was published this year. And basically at the left hand side you've got uh, the lower technology readiness levels which is more about basic science and research and the TRLs up to eight and nine which are, are much more about pre-commercial deployment. And this is a map of all the bodies that are spending money on energy research development and demonstration in the UK. And it has commonly been said this is a very, very complicated picture as to how we're actually going, going about things. So we have the research councils uh, you know, at the, at the left-hand side, but a number of overlapping bodies, notably the Technology Strategy Board, the Energy Technologies Institute, and the carbon trust that are all sort of overlapping in terms of you know, the, the kind of applied research early demonstration part of the picture. Worthwhile saying that Ofgem is getting to be a very critical part of this picture under their new regulatory regime which allows people like National Grid to spend lots of money now on R&D which I was hearing this afternoon much of which is ending up in Southampton so, so uh, no doubt this is a, you, you're getting the benefit of, of this kind of activity as well. Now, just to flag, there are a number of bodies that have criticised the UK for the way it does things. The National Audit Office 
conducted a, a, a review of support for renewable energy in 2010, which was fairly damning about you know, the way that things were organized. The programs by different bodies were not being monitored and evaluated properly. There was no real published information on the cost effectiveness of the programs. Uh, they took a number of case studies and found they'd never been evaluated properly or else there were no evaluation frameworks in place. And there was a wonderful example where the Technology Strategy Board and the Carbon Trust were about to put out similar calls for proposals for the same research at the same time. So three of the bodies got together to create something called the Low Carbon Innovation Group, uh, which was TSB, Energy Technologies Institute and the Carbon Trust, to make sure they never made that mistake again of trying to double fund research. And DEC then knocked on the door, and now almost all of the bodies that you saw in the previous slide are members of something called the Low Carbon Innovation Coordination Group that's producing a wonderful set of web published things called Technology Innovation Needs Assessments to get a very coordinated view of what applied R&D is actually needed. The uh, International Energy Agency reviews every country's energy policies every five or six years, you know, subject, so countries are subject to peer review. The latest report came out earlier this year, and it did comment favourably about the fact that the R&D spend was now up to IEA median levels again, which, which was obviously a good thing. But it really picked up the same criticism that the National Audit Office had picked up, that uh, th it was a very fragmented landscape with a limited amount of, um, of coordination between different bodies. And it particularly emphasized the, the fact that the, the makeup of the R&D program did not appear to reflect entirely the policy, stated policy priorities for the UK. So in principle, you could get a better alignment between the UK's energy policy and what we were actually spending our energy R&D budgets on. Now, the one that's uh, of much, more, much greater personal interest to me, this review of how the UK do, th do things, was that the Research Council's energy programme has been running since about 2004. And EPSRC, uh, which, which is leading the programme, always conducts international peer reviews of its energy pro of its programme activities. And the energy, pro the energy programme's term came in 2010. So an international review panel, and many of you may be, have been involved in these processes, spend a lot of time interviewing, listening to presentations from UK academics and others to conduct this review. And the homework question they were given by the EPSRC is in the top right hand corner there. You know, is the energy research funded through the energy programme delivering impact in the UK and worldwide? That was the question it, it was asked to address. Um, headline conclusion, good news, across almost all areas we found interesting leading edge and world class research, international re reputation is deservedly earned. Now when somebody says something like that you know there's going to be a but that, that, <laughs> that, that follows it up and this is the but effectively, three of them. Impact, uh, the academic community is well regarded but in terms of impact on economic benefit, in industry development, etc., the commercialization of technologies arising from the research, it saw weakness and weaknesses. It was impressed by the number of PhDs coming through the system, but because of a lack of clarity about the long-term future, was concerned about the issue of career paths for people further down the line. And they, they were also concerned about the balance between open-ended discovery and targeted strategic programs. And they commented on the lack of transparency of the process about how R&D uh, priorities for the research councils are actually arrived at. Uh, so th this again is something that's pointing to a need for more focus, more coordination, very much backing up what the International Energy Agency and the National Audit Office had actually said. I may say that I actually think personally that this international review panel exceeded its brief because it was asked to talk about the Research Council's energy programme and many of its recommendations were of a flavour where they were more about the entire energy research and innovation landscape right through the way, right through to commercial deployment, which was a bit beyond what it was actually asked to do. But nevertheless, they overstepped the mark, which other people might find useful actually at the end of the day.
So they, they came up with an overarching conclusion and a recommendation. I've kind of summarized what the conclusions were. They talked about uh, di different funding bodies, competition between them, lack of transparency, and uh, poor mechanisms for moving technologies onto deployment. So the recommendation was the panel of the panel was to produce a fully in integrated roadmap in inverted commas for UK energy research targets so that everybody understood what everybody else is doing. I have to say, I think I heard that before in about 2002, but you need to repeat these messages to, uh, to keep it going. So that brings it to me because I am partly the answer to the recommendation <laughs> that, that the International Review Panel made. Uh, so the Research Council has advertised for an energy strategy fellow at the back end of last year to develop a roadmap in inverted commas for a reason I'll come on to uh, of research skills and training needs across the energy landscape, identify gaps, um, think about ways of evaluating, prioritizing and implementing research needs. Needless to say, work closely with both the research councils and DEC and the people at the more applied end of the spectrum, organize meetings and workshops, act as an advocate for the energy program and act impartially and independently. How I reconcile the last two, I'm not quite sure, but we'll, but we'll ask another question. Okay, now, first of all to say, uh, Aidan Rhodes, who's a new colleague that I recruited to carry out the work with me on this, we both went to a technology road mapping training course at uh, the Cambridge Institute for Manufacturing in April. And the first thing I think we learned from that training course that what we were being asked to produce was not a road map uh, because it didn't go all through the way to commercial deployment. And the word road map trips off everybody's tongue far too easily. So we have decided not to call it a road map but a prospectus and have sold the research councils on that. Prospectus is a really wishy-washy word, and we think we could look for a better one, but if we say strategy or plan, it will imply the research councils have endorsed it, which they haven't. This is evidence for the research councils, not the plan itself. Uh, so that's the kind of vision that we have had. We mean, we're, we're trying to say that it's to create the evidence base which the research councils can work off while taking into account the needs and the activities of other people in the energy innovation landscape government departments, technology strategy board, etc. And some of the issues that I think I would identify, I mean, if we, when you get a brief like that from the research councils, I think it's worthwhile challenging a little bit in some ways when you, when you put in your bid. The question of the boundary between the research council's energy program and more applied activity is an important one. They constantly emphasize the 80% uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction target as the policy thing you needed to think about. Though I'm on the Committee on Climate Change and recommended it, there is a wider world out there and so energy security needs to be taken into account. And I think anybody putting together a R and D portfolio needs to think about a range of futures against which that portfolio would be robust. Not everything you do will come through. And for example there, the fact that the research councils were proposing to reduce research on fossil energy just as the gas explosion was taking place in the United States is probably not the direction you would ideally like to go. So robust against uncertainty, it will look at training and human, human capital needs as well, but we also want to think about links with underlying science and engineering. And we've actually spent a bit of time over the summer talking to the learned societies and professional bodies about that, as that aspect of it. So we will be producing a web-based tool which will include a top-level document that looks across the whole energy research landscape. We'll also produce a hard copy of that for, for publicity purposes. But then we will have a much wider range of web-based documents that focus on particularly topics within uh, energy R&D. Now, we have spent the whole summer almost consulting with people about how we're actually going to conduct this activity over the next year. It will be heavily workshop based to get the evidence that we need to take it forward. When I went for my interview for the fellowship, uh, my outline bid was criticized because it didn't take account of stakeholders outside the norm. If anybody here is a stakeholder outside the norm, <laughs> I would like to know who, who, who you are. But the message I took from it, your know, wide stakeholder engagement was going to be needed to take this forward. 
And for that reason, we've actually divided our workshops into two sorts. We're going to have strategic level workshops, uh, which will cut across the energy domain. One will be about linking the energy R&D to projections, energy projections for the UK and the world more broadly, and the kind of portfolio of technologies that you think you might need. And we are being very careful to make sure that we take account of private sector projections as well as those coming out of the UK government, because there's some very big differences between them that we need to bottom out a bit in that workshop. My first meeting uh, meetings were actually with all of the research councils in Swindon, and I saw them all in different rooms at different times, and it was then, which was deliberate, and there were then very different views about how the energy programme should uh, evolve. So the role of social and environmental sciences within the energy programme is going to be one of the topics that we're going to do a bit of a deep dive in in one of these strategy workshops. And then the final strategy workshop will be about the relationship between the research councils and other uh, bodies active in the energy innovation domain, uh, particularly TSB and Energy Technologies Institute, etc. Now, in 2013, we're actually going to do run six what we're calling expert workshops. We initially called them technical workshops, but the environmental scientists and uh, social scientists complained and said it wasn't about technology, it was about behaviour as well. So we've called them expert workshops instead to, to reflect that. And so these are the six topics that we're, we're actually planning to pick up. And I was actually meeting with, with BISBEC and BBSRC this morning in London about the bioenergy one, which will be one of the first ones that we run. Just to flag up, to, to, to sort of pick, pick, some, pick out some of them, fossil fuels and CCS will probably be a little bit wider. We need to take account of the role of geological sciences more broadly, and that includes things like geothermal, energy, fracking for natural gas, etc. But that will be covered in that fossil fuels and CCS one. The mysteriously entitled electrochemical energy technologies is where you're going to find a lot of material science kinds of activities. There's a lot of commonality actually in the underlying science around PV, fuel cells, batteries, etc. that we think we can pull people together within work one workshop and make it more productive. Energy infrastructure will not just be electricity, it will be heat, the, you know, the, the kind of issues as well. It would cover smart grid. And I've been lobbied heavily by the energy efficiency, new energy efficiency de uh, deployment office in DEC uh, because they would like to tie in very closely to what we're going to do in energy use in buildings effectively in consumer response. And again, reflecting the views of the social researchers and social scientists, rather than calling this energy in buildings, we're going to call it energy in the home and workplace. Uh, so it emphasizes it's not just about the technology in the kit, it's about the people and the way that people interact with technology. Just to flag, there are one or two subjects which we will not be running workshops on because we think there's so much work that's actually gone on already out there. Nuclear fission, John Beddington, Chief Scientific Advisor to the government, is conducting a review at the moment. Uh, Lord John Krebs has conducted a review on training skills needs through the House of Lords Committee. Wind, wave and tide, we think the technology innovation needs assessments that the Low Carbon Innovation Coordination Group has been doing have covered that really quite adequately. And on industrial processes, which is rather missing from the Research Council's energy programme, we think we could get the people who are able to talk about it in the UK around a single table, so we don't see any need for an elaborate, elaborate workshop, workshop to do that. So that's roughly what we plan to do. And next summer, we will peer review all this stuff, get it web published, and you know, launch it, and try to persuade the research councils that there's some operational uh, insight to be gained from it. We will be updating the prospectus on an annual, annual basis, because it's intended to be a living document. So we will consult annually about which bits are falling behind. Uh, we, will, we have the resources available to conduct one or two extra workshops to bring things up to date on an annual basis. And just to say, uh, you know, when, when I put the bid in about letters of support from people, they were extremely generous. <coughs> Department of Energy and Climate Change uh, offered us desk space in the Science and Innovation Group, which my two colleagues may take up, but I won't because as a member of the Committee on Climate Change, I cannot possibly be compromised by sitting in a government department. Uh, Energy Technologies Institute has offered us access to their unpublished analysis, 
to help us think about energy futures and various other, other bodies we've also talked to and engaged with. What I should say, and this, this is actually the, the last slide, the fellowship doesn't only include the development of this roadmap that's not a roadmap, it also includes a research program which we are going to do on the effectiveness of energy innovation systems internationally, comparing the US, European countries, and we are currently exploring with the uh, Foreign Office Science and Innovation Network, who are very keen on that research project, whether we could actually do something in China as well. So my life has changed completely over the last uh, few months. Uh, it's still changing very rapidly, but I hope you've got a sense of just how exciting the energy innovation landscape is at the moment and you, what the kind of opportunities actually are. And I'm looking forward to playing some role in thinking about how it develops. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Jim. That, that was great. Um, fantastic job you've got uh, ahead of you. Just, just looking at your list of workshops there, I think Southampton can contribute, contribute yeah. to each of these, yeah. <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah. Um, is it, is it going to be open to, I mean, how's it we will, we, we, I mean, the, uh, the specialised workshops will be down to about 30 to 35 people. Right. Who we will invite. Okay. But expressions of interest to participate are <coughs> right. and will be noted. Yeah. We will get those off to you soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could we uh, have any questions for Jim? Yeah. Um, hi, Innocent Shared from Computer Science, and I'm perhaps one of your stakeholders outside the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at, in particular, uh, just as a context, a refresh. The project's called Refresh, and we are looking at actually the effect of energy efficiency on cognitive performance in the workplace, and mm -hmm. you see how to design around that. That question has nothing to do with that. What I'm wondering is, it's a brilliant presentation. Uh, it's terrific to see the conceptualization of past research and potential future research and impacts. Uh, and the question came up about uh, the economic impact of current, more or less current research. I'm wondering if the analysis has been done of the past 30 or 50 years of R&D when funding was much higher to be able to say, well, we can see historically that we do get that economic impact and transfer even if we haven't seen it recently. Does that kind of data yeah. exist and has that been produced? Yeah, I mean, th this is actually one where we've been doing quite a lot of discussion with the International Energy Agency people because part of their task is to help countries sort of design programs of R&D that are effective in the energy domain. And they did again produce a report earlier this year which contained a range of metrics for how you might judge the success of energy programs. You have some very contextual kind of indicators, some of them very process oriented <coughs> about the effectiveness of programs. But really, it hasn't been done in a very scientific way in the past. And actually, that's all what, what the research program that we're planning is going to be all about. We will be trying to develop metrics and indicators and understand what's going on. I mean, just on, on the past effectiveness, I mean, obviously, you look back to the 1970s and 80s and you look at the volume of R&D that was spent on nuclear fission, for example, and given the relatively low level of deployment of nuclear fission in some countries and the fact that a number of countries are deliberately, as a policy choice, transitioning out of it, well, you, you have to say that probably that, mo that, that money that was invested in R&D did not pay off. But I think, you know, when you look at these kind of historical shifts, it's hard to be critical, you know, of people for doing that. I, I would be very surprised if some of the money we're spending now does not turn out you know, to be non-productive investment. But it's also partly the nature of R&D. It is a risk. You're taking a punt on it. That's, that's part of it. Um, it seems like nuclear fusion doesn't get the uh, research funding that it deserves. Why, why do you think that is? Um, because, because, well, th th there's a very, uh, you know, glib answer that says because it's almost 40 years ago. <laughs> but, but, I mean, the reason I have agreed with the research councils that fusion is going to be without, out with the scope of this activity because it is of such a different character. To, to the other things. In many countries other than the UK, fusion research is not classified as energy research, it's classified as more fundamental scientific endeavour. And so the justification for it has been made in, in a different kind of way. 
and, and I think perhaps it's unfortunate in a sense that uh, you know fusion in the UK has become very tied up with the idea that you have to demonstrate you know r the real prospect for commercial deployment. I mean, I think the climate change ambition has had impacts on that aspect of the fusion agenda because the claim would have been that you're going to get cheap and clean electricity. Now, ITER won't deliver electricity into a grid until the 2040s under their current roadmap, and the UK plans to decarbonise its electricity system by 2030. So if there are other technologies in place, it kind of weakens that argument a bit. Fusion is a really a very, very special case, I think. Yeah, and I think I'm right in saying it's still getting moderately well funded, yeah. relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you can argue that the magnitude is not big enough, but mm -hmm. you know, you compare it, last time I looked at least for EPSRC's budget, I think there was quite a chunk that was coming yeah. off the top, basically, yeah. um, for, for, uh, for fusion. So it's not yeah. not getting ignored by any means. Yeah. And, and these, these arguments are sort of yeah, persistent. I think it yeah. comes up every time. Yeah, I, I think also the, the issue that the, the expenditure needed is so large, it can only be done through international yeah. collaboration. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I, for my my own view, is you know it's a sensible policy that is being adopted in many areas. Another question. Yeah, you put energy conservation at the top of the list. Hmm. How do you propose to achieve that? Energy energy con conservation. Well. Um, Frankly, the, the issue with lots of energy conservation is not a necessarily a need for new technologies. It's the policies and the frameworks to get people to change what they actually do. And I think we have given up on, you know, it is an incredibly difficult issue, issue to get your head around to persuade people to do things. It's, you know, people think that simple technologies, it's going to be easy. It's not you know, to get people to change the way that they do things. I think it actually needs much better effort through the through the way that utilities are regulated and what they kind of invest in in terms of energy efficiency in homes lots of us are deeply skeptical about the government's green deal which is the is the big initiative that's coming through at the moment because we're slightly disappointed that the carbon emission reduction target appears to be working to getting lots of insulation in people's houses but for through policy innovation we're putting in place a new policy that's untested and fairly speculative in terms of its its delivery i th i mean i think things can can be done there on on conservation and you know, it's in the built environment that you know, is the biggest opportunity. It's cheap, but it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to get the right social processes in place. DEC, uh, I should say, has recruited, I wouldn't call it a battalion, but a platoon of social researchers to actually help it and engage better with the academic community around these issues. If I may just add, compared to other countries, we've been very, very slow to upgrade our, our um, building regulations to uh, yeah. improve dwellings. Yeah, politically in Britain we like choice, and it's actually, it's actually quite. There are things that you could do. I mean, thinking about you, you know behavioural economics and nudge kind of ideas. There are probably more things that you could do in terms of regulation. I think to move on. In other countries, markets are more tightly regulated. For example, in Germany, where they put much uh, heavier uh, emphasis on sort of deep changes to buildings, they have a system of regulated rents. And landlords actually can charge larger rents if they if they rent out a more energy efficient house. In an unregulated market like the UK, uh, these things don't happen because the landlords don't get the return on the energy efficiency investments, whereas the you know the, the, their tenants get the savings. Why are utility companies in this country allowed to charge have a price structure whereby the more energy you use, the less you pay for you with energy? Uh, well, it does cost more to supply more energy, so, so, so there's a, a certain kind of log logic about it, but certainly you could do interesting things with rising block tariffs, for example, that's something that's been looked at that might also help with uh, fuel poverty kind of issues, you know, where your first units come cheap and your later units come, become more expensive. But again, it's about this issue, I mean, we have very liberalised uh, retail markets for energy in the UK, and the consequence of that is that people will charge what they think is cost reflective or you know, what will uh, what will push up the profits. John? Jim, uh, I think you said that a low carbon economy would be an electric economy. Does that mean that you rule out hydrogen as a potential energy carrier? No. Uh, no not 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 at all. And and one of the one of the things is you know when the 
we, we think there'll be more electrical technologies, but there would be other, I mean, I was simplifying a, you know, a complicated picture. The Committee on Climate Change develops indicators to sort of measure government progress, which many of which are related to deployment of technologies. But we don't regard that indicator as a blueprint for the future. It's, it's, it is what it said. It's an indicator. It, you will fall behind on some of them, but you might make, make more progress elsewhere. I think the thing with hydrogen and vehicles, it may well be that you know, there are different technologies that will take, take up different niches within the transport market. For example, hydrogen might, not well, might well not start out with private vehicles. It might be heavy goods vehicles or whatever. That's a better niche in which to, which to put it. One more question. Um, I think personally, wind technology is one of the most promising technologies. It's shown success in a numerous or numerous amounts of countries that have implemented it as a key strategy as part of their energy infrastructure. Um, one of the main arguments against it is that it takes up a lot of space and it takes up a lot of land. I was just wondering if research has been done in the UK in regards to the amount of um, energy that certain wind farms can produce the amount of area that would be required to meet the energy um, needs of the UK itself and kind of what yeah. that ratio was looking like. Yeah, yeah. Just to just say, on, on wind, I, I think there is a, I mean, wind does cost more than an unabated natural gas power station. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Though some of the onshore wind sites in the best locations may be operating, but getting very close to wholesale market price parity with other forms of generation. The question of um, the acceptability of wind, which you've, you've kind of put in a, in a slightly different way about, about land needs. I mean, first of all, to say that wind farms don't sterilize the land that they're sitting on. You can still graze cattle and use the land for other kinds of, other kinds of purposes. You're not, you're not sort of taking land out of, out of other productive use. You can, the land can be used for two things. The big issue that's obviously driving it in the UK is the question of landscape and visual impact of wind farms, for which there has there have been in places quite a lot of local opposition, which I have to say is almost joining up to form a bit of a move, a national movement at the moment. I mean, you just need to read the pages of the Daily Mail and the, you know, the the the, the blogs that go behind it to to get a sense of that. So there, I, I think progress or with onshore wind will be. Uh, perhaps more limited, especially in England, there appears to be less opposition in Scotland. As we're talking about, there's a new high voltage DC cable going to help to bring the power down from the north to the demand centers in the south. But that reason for landscape is there's in why we're pushing offshore with wind as well, which does push up the cost, but it means that you know the, the, the usual people who uh, oppose it are fishermen and recreational boaters, basically. You know, it's a, Offshore wind farms are good for fish and bad for fishermen, you know, to, 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 to sum it up very briefly. But it is a much more expensive technology, though there will be a drive to get the costs down as deployment goes up. All right, thanks. Yeah, no, we've got one more, one more question. One last one. Just to follow up on that question, actually, I mean, the, the whole idea of having in, integrated um, energy policy into the UK um, drives, you know, energy security. But there's a wider issue. I mean, for example, Desert Tech is trying to connect up all of the European countries to extract energy from North Africa in terms of yeah. wind, solar, etc. And bring it, you know, so you have this, so you integrate over the entire, energy, you know, your re renewable energy landscape across all those countries, and so you get a constant supply. And that way you can you even out any sort of um, ups and downs in terms of generation demand. Is that, is that not more of a sort of um, yeah, I mean, j just to say on, on joining up, I mean, Gordon Strabak at Imperial uh, did a, a very good study as a contribution to a European Climate Foundation project that demonstrated the benefits of greater inter inter interconnection with, within Europe to help balance renewable energy overall. I have to say that it, it produced some incredibly ambitious numbers like 30 gigawatts of transmission between Spain and France, for example, uh, which seemed a little bit implausible in terms of the difficulties of siting new, new transmission lines. But the general principle that if you have more renewable energy who, where the resource is locationally specific, it is going to place a greater value on transmission and interconnection as, as the way forward. It's a very logical you know, economic argument for that. Now, the question then is you know, how does that actually come about? 
does it take place with a top-down desert uh, kind of, of means of development, or does it take place through more in, more incremental individual merchant-based pro transmission projects? Personally, I think that latter option is, is much more likely. I know a lot of companies, especially German ones, have got involved in the desert tech project, but I know talking to them offline that you know it's a hedging strategy. They're keeping an interest. <coughs> committed to it like that, the desert tech concept. They have to keep in with it because it's pro probably the direction in which we will go. But I, I would expect it to be a much more incremental kind of development. But the economics of the greater interconnection are pretty unarguable at the moment. When you talk about putting renewable generation in different countries, are, are we tied down by the national targets that have been agreed for various places as to where where these things should be sited, or, or is it possible to put it in the place where it works best? Well, well, there's obviously some constraints from the Renewable Energy d Directive in Brussels. I mean, the UK would not be going as fast as it is at the moment. I actually think it would be better if we had gone slightly more slowly, because we're putting an offshore wind so fast, we're not learning the lessons from one way of deployment before you go on to the next one. And I think you get better technology learning by actually doing it. Uh, Doing it slightly more slowly, but no, I mean, that's, I mean, the complementarity is still there. I mean, the example of, that's obvious is, uh, for example, a transmission line between the UK and Norway, where you could match a British wind resource with with Norwegian pump storage. I have to say the Norwegians have probably sold their same resource to about four different countries now. But uh, you know, the general the general principle, you you know, yeah, is, is there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think perhaps we ought to close it there. Uh, I think I'm right in saying, Gail, that we... B85, the observatory. Um, please come and join uh, Jim for a glass of wine and some hosters. That would be so great. So free drinks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up in Building 85, the observatory. Perhaps get a chance to speak to Jim one more time. But before we close, I'd just like to give my thanks to Jim for taking a couple of comments. Uh, thank you. <laughs>